side tells you this is right. That's called smriti. We have this innate within us. What's the verse that describes this in Chaitanya Charitamrita? You know? Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhya Kabhonai Shravanada Shuddhi Chitte Kare Udoi. That means because the constitutional position of every spiritual entity is to be a servant of Krishna, therefore that consciousness just has to be aroused by hearing and chanting about Krishna. And that will happen if we repeatedly hear and chant about Krishna. That's why I asked you, please recite the verse. Prain alpa yusa shabhya. Anybody who knows it, please. George say. Only one person is studying here. Prain alpa yusa shabhya kalawas min yuge janaha manda sumanda matayaha manda bhagya hyupatrataha. Okay, so by hearing and chanting like this, our minds gradually become awakened and they become purified in Krishna consciousness. All of our misconceptions, all of our false understandings, imaginations, concocted ideas about what reality is, it all gets uh, dissipated because it's like a sh somebody turned on the lights and you can see everything very clearly. So the gopis' minds in Vrindavan, their minds are all free of this misconception, concoction, stupidity, all, all the things that plague our minds. They're already free of these things because they're naturally fixed on Krishna. That he's their only interest, completely, always, and in every, by all means as well. And Padyavali, Sri Rupa Goswami has depicted the situation of these gopis of Vrindavan. He says, Dinao dao murare nisha dao murare Dinarthe murare nisharthe murare Dinante murare nishante murare Tuameka gatirnas tuameko gatirna You understand? It's pretty clear, easy Sanskrit means in the beginning of the day and in the beginning of the night, at midday and at midnight, at the end of the day and at the end of the night, their only goal is Krishna. Here it's put in the second person, my dear Murari, you are our only goal. It's a good idea to think like this when you wake up in the morning. What do you think of first thing? If the answer is your toothbrush, not good. If the answer is breakfast, still not good. Maybe you're a little bit more passionate than that and thinking about the day's activities or your goal of, for your work or whatever it is. It's still not really good because you can die any time. That is a fact. Eight goli sub samatwi. It's a fact. This happened to me once, not me, but I witnessed this once in Dallas, Texas. We had a very nice a Gujarati man, was a life member, very active member of our congregation. So this was back in what was it? Maybe the 1980s. And things were not so bad then with guns, but he thought that he could just open his door when somebody knocked at 10 o'clock. And the last thing he saw was the barrel of a gun. Bright flash, out. So I had to speak at his funeral and somehow or other console his family members. They moved in, they tied everyone up. Luckily, they didn't rape anybody, but at least they, they robbed everything. And then he was out, finished. So... We never know. What does Shankaracharya says? Nalani dalagata jalam atitaralam tadva jivitam atishaya chapalam. Human life is as tenuous as a drop of water on a lotus leaf. And this man is proof of it. And there are others also. We've all heard. Want to hear another one? I spent 20 years in Texas. But it's not just, this happens everywhere, not just Texas. A boy, a young boy, 14 years old, with his friends, like American teenagers do, even though, well, he was American, actually. <laughs> a, B, C, D. <laughs> so, you know, he, he stole, he got the keys of the car, and he stole his parents' car, but because he was 14 and didn't know what he was doing, he just went straight into a pylon at the bottom of a freeway 
and again, out, out cold. So, you know, we don't really know. Another gentleman I knew in Los Angeles this time, proof that it happens outside Texas. <laughs> he was driving home from work one night and just, you know, in the middle of a traffic jam, he had a heart attack and gone, just like that. Anyway, we would go on and on and on. The, the, this, the story plays out every day in front of us and still we don't see. Pashyanna vina pashyati, Bhagavatam says. What is the whole verse? Okay. We see what we don't see. This is the point. We, we see intellectually. We, we don't see in terms of, you know, hey, this is like reality. <laughs> this can be me next. There's really no reason why it can't be any one of us next. Maybe it will be. We don't know. So we don't gamble either. This is gambling if we ignore these facts. All right. So anyway, the gopis are not so much beleaguered as we are, but murari padar pita chitta vrittihi. This, their consciousness is constantly fixed on Krishna. So much so that even while they're selling their dairy products, even while they're milking cows, even while they're churning butter, caring for children, cleaning, preparing cow dung fuel, all other activities in the village of Vrindavan, still they're always thinking about Krishna. They're always singing about Krishna's qualities and his names with profound feeling they're singing, singing in this way because their minds are wholly given over to him. Can it not happen here? What city are we in? <laughs> I'm so moving around so much. I don't know if I'm in North Carolina or Phoenix, Arizona or <laughs> Dallas, Texas. We're in Portland, Oregon. So even in Portland, Oregon, and even in 2023, and even though you're an IT professional instead of a cowherd uh, village girl, you can still fix your mind on Krishna. Raise your hand if you took a shower this morning. <laughs> I think we're all civilized. And we all eat and we all bathe. So do these things, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, in such a way that you can remember me. When I take my bath, I don't want to get too personal here, but <laughs> I always remember the Yamuna River and chant prayers that glorify Yamuna. For example, what is that? Bhraturantakasya Pattane Bibhatti Harini. She's called Sarvada Aravinda Bandhu Nandini. She's the daughter of that person who pleases the lotus flowers, always. Who pleases the lotus flowers? The sun. Why does the sun please the lotus flowers? Because when the sun comes out, the flowers open up. And the little bees that are stuck inside all night, <laughs> they get freed. Actually, the poet, Braj poet Surdas, he, he wrote some beautiful songs about Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. And he says that just when Krishna gets tired in the evening, his little lotus eyes begin to close. Just like when the sun goes down, the lotus is petals start closing. So sometimes when the lotus petals close, there are little bees that get stuck inside the lotus flower. They can't get out again. They have to wait until the morning. So when the lotus flower opens up again with the appearance of their friend, the sun, then the little bees come buzzing out. And where do they go? Where do bees go? Huh? They don't remain there. That's like when the elevator door opens and you just stay there, right? It doesn't work like that. Uh, they go to Krishna's hair. Okay. Ah? Uh, they go to the flowers because they're always looking for nectar. That's why they're called saranga. Saranga. Sarang. We all know this word, no? Sarang. They kraghe. Hindustani Shastriya Sangeet mein. Vrindavani Sarang. <laughs> The bees of Vrindavan, you can translate like that. And in fact, there's one instrument, sarangi, <laughs> also. Sarang means they're going for the nectar, the honey, the essence. 
So the honey exists where? If you're a bee, the honey exists in Krishna's lotus face because Krishna's face is like a lotus flower also. But what, what happens if you're Krishna? You're not, for your information, but with Krishna, it's a little different situation. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu describes this. Muda abhiri nadi vadana kamala asvada madhupaha. He's like a bee that tastes the nectar of the lotus faces of the gopis. This is what the men in this world would like to do also. Every single woman's face they want to enjoy as if they were Madhu, Krishna. But therefore, Krishna is called Madhusudan. <laughs> only if you, only if you associate with him, can you can you get free from this. But anyway, these bees they, they come buzzing out and, and they're looking for the lotus flowers. So similarly, the son is called the friend of the lotus for that reason, and the son's daughter is whom. Yamuna. Yeah, actually, Yamuna, there's no such word in Sanskrit, believe it or not. It's a, it's a Sanskrit neologism. Actually, the real name should be Yama Anuja, the younger sister of Yama. Yama and Yami, those who have been to Mathura Vishranti Ghat, you know, they're brother and sister. The god of death and Yamuna River are brother and sister, and their father is Suryadev. Who is their mother? Huh? Two mothers. One mother is called Sandhya. The other mother is called Chaya. Two mothers means one is a stepmother, actually. The, anybody here is celebrating this festival called uh, Bhayaduj? In Vrindavan, very popular. It's also in Sanskrit called Yamadvitiya. means the same thing. Yamato Bhayaha. So the story is that Sandhya, the wife of Surya, she couldn't handle her husband. Sometimes husbands are hard to handle, right? <laughs> and so, because he was so bright, even with sunglasses, it didn't help. So she had to go back to her father's house for some time just to get a break. Oh, her eyes were sore. But she thought, I don't want to, I don't want to set a bad example because after all, I'm a demigod and you know it's, it's not good. So she had to do her duty. So she created a facsimile of herself, and that fix, facsimile is called Chaya, naturally. So Chaya was everything, doing everything, all of her cooking and taking care of the children, everything just like Sanjaya was doing. But the children could understand she she's not the same. So they became suspicious, especially Yama. Yama is an older brother, so he didn't like it. So he, he ran away from home. Sometimes when children get mad, they, they try to run away from home, isn't it? Krishna did this also. Anybody remember Damodar Lila? What happened? He was going to run away because his mother, Krishna and his mother that day was a very, <laughs> very, very traumatic day for, for Mother Yashoda especially, but... Um, she was mad because Krishna was doing so many nonsense things. And she said, you're, you're just like one of these monkeys. Everybody knows when you go to Brindavan, the monkeys, they steal your glasses. They'll see anything edible, any plastic bag, even sometimes bead bags, cell phones, be anything they will take at any time. And they just seem to drop out of the sky from nowhere. But... Uh, so she was saying that you're just like this. And he got so, Krishna got so upset with this. He said, okay, if I'm, if I'm just like a monkey, then I'm going to live with the monkeys. And then my, oh my God, what did I said? What's going to happen now? That's the real reason that she tied him up. The, the excuse was that he was doing so many not, naughty things, but actually she was afraid because he's mad. He might, he might actually try and do something and get hurt. Out of love, she's tying him up like this. But anyway, it's a long story. We, we don't have time for that. But the point is that um, Yamuna Devi is the younger sister of Yama. And when Yama could understand that Chaya is not really their mother, he ran away from home. Yamuna, looking for her older brother everywhere, she couldn't find him anywhere. But she sent people out looking. Nobody could find him anywhere. Finally, she found him, and where was he? At Vishramghat in Mathura. 
And she somehow or other, she had cooked so many things and she just pleased him. And she said, you please come home. And Yamarad said, okay. In fact, he was so happy that he said, I, you, whatever you want for me, I, I, you know, you can have it. So she said, okay, please give me the benediction that anybody who bathes in my water will never have to see you. Matlab <laughs> ki, they'll never have to have an unpleasant interview with you about their karmic debits and credits. So that's why Rup Goswami says, her brother is the person who removes the calamity of having to go to Yama, Yamalok and, you know, having this uh, uncomfortable interview with Yamaraj about your karmic account, among other things. So in, if we can meditate like this, even when you're taking a shower in Portland, Oregon, instead of meditating on the, uh, what is it called, Willamette River? Why not meditate on Yamuna River? Krishna says, yad, yad kuroshi, yad ishnasi, yad juhoshi, tadasi, yad, yad tapasyasi, konte, yad tad, kurushva, mad arpanam. Do that as an offering to me. But we can think of Krishna like this. Now, Vrindavan is a very special place because it's described in the Brahma Samhita, Chintamani Prakara Sadma. This is a nice house, new house, good neighborhood. But is it made out of Chintamani stones? No, it's made out of concrete, plywood, like that. So in Vrindavan, all the houses are made out of Chintamani. Chintamani Prakara Sadmasu. Kalpa Vriksha Laksha Avriteshu. And they're surrounded by Kalpa Vrikshas. Desire trees, trees that fulfill your every desire if you just be humble and bow to them and pray to them, glorify them. They'll fulfill all of your desires. I've experienced it. And how many such trees are surrounding your house in Vrindavan? Laksha, that means lacks, lacks of such trees. And what else? Avrateshu surabhir abhipaliyantam. Krishna is tending what kind of cows? Surabhi cows, kamadenu cows. So the dust of Vrindavan, the trees of Vrindavan, the cows of Vrindavan, all three will fulfill your desires. That's why you have to be very careful what you desire. If you're cultivating desires appropriate for Portland, Oregon, then there's no need to go to Vrindavan. You belong, you want to be in Portland, Oregon. And you will come back to Portland, Oregon. But if you're thinking about Vrindavan all the time, then by the time you actually get there, your desires will be appropriate for Vrindavan. And then you can get love, real love. What are you looking for in Portland, Oregon? What if you have everything? All the money, all the houses, all the prestige, the cars, children, everything nice, but no love. Tikrahega? I don't think so. So we actually want love, and this love is only found at the lotus feet of Krishna. Not even we can say the lotus feet of Krishna, we should say the lotus feet of the spiritual master, because that's the way that we get Krishna. Sri Guru Charana Padma Keva La Bhakti Sadma. We're talking about Chintamani Prakara Sadmas, right? This is the real thing. Two lotus feet of the spiritual master will give you Krishna. Jahara Prasade Bhai, E Bhava Toriyajai. Krishna prapti hoy jaha hoy te. This is Narutam Das Thakur has given us such a wonderful, wonderful poem that we can and should sing every day because Srila Prabhupada instructed us to do so. If we really just, why would Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, for example, write a Sanskrit commentary on this Bengali song, which he did, <laughs> if it did not have that depth of meaning? Elsewhere in his writings, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur said, whatever Narottam Das Thakur speaks, that's as good as the Vedas. Shrutivat, he says. So, you know, to say something is Shrutivat, that's very special because there are two kinds of Vedic literatures. What are they? Shruti and? What's the difference? Shruti means? Yeah, what is hurt? Literally, that's the meaning. But Shruti refers specifically to the four Vedas. 
And that includes all the Upanishads, because the Upanishads are inside the Vedas. And then Smriti means Puranas, Mahabharata, uh, Itihasas, it, it, epics, all the Bhakti Rasamrita, Sindhu, even Chaitanya Charitamrita technically can be considered a Smriti. But why do we call it Smriti instead of Shruti? Because it's written in such a way that recollects the teachings of the Shruti. So Shruti, Shastra Yonitvat, everything comes from the Shruti originally. And those literatures that are transparently representing the Shruti, they're called Smriti. You can't just write any nonsense and think that it's also Smriti. It's not like that. So anyway, uh, Vishnad Chakravarti Thakur says about Narottam's poetry, he said it's just like the Shruti, just as author authoritative as the Shruti. And this is why, because he can say something so deep as this. All right, so um, these women are all glorifying Krishna in these ways. And uh, all day long, all night long, they're only thinking of Krishna. Uddhava. Uddhava is considered to be Krishna's greatest devotee. There are three Haridasa Varyas. Does anyone know who they are? Haridasa Varya, the best of Haridasas. Who are they? Giridaj Govardhanek? Or? Yudhishthir Maharaj. Or? Uddhava. Yetim. So he says in the 11th canto, my dear Lord, you are the supreme soul and thus you are most dear to us. We are your devotees. How can we possibly reject you or live without you even for a moment? Whether we are lying down, sitting, walking, standing, bathing, enjoying recreation, eating or doing anything else, we are constantly engaged in your service. This is what our life is meant for. Ek madhya yogin kavi ne kaha ki jabalaga taname tapana vyapai tabalaga kari hari seva. You don't know. We've already discussed. Anything can be lost anytime. Or, you know, what if you wake up blind one day? This is another true story. One friend of ours in Los Angeles, she, she tried, she woke up and she went to use the bathroom as we do every day and she couldn't see anything. She was blind. These things happen. Or maybe you won't go blind, but maybe, you know, you can you can have everything in life, but you cannot urinate anymore. <laughs> that would be also very uncomfortable. Or maybe you go crazy. That also happens. Or maybe Saturn moves in and you're just, nothing works anymore. Everything against you. Anybody, <laughs> anybody here in Saturn? <laughs> you know very well what I'm talking about if you've been experienced. So, you know, our whole karmic situation is a very delicate balance. It's just being held together by a combination of our own punya and mercy. That's why it's a good idea to maintain those two things. Stay pious and stay within the good graces of the Lord and his devotees and everything should be okay. Okay. That means, you know, it's not going to ever be blissful here, but it will be okay. And it looks to me like you're all doing pretty much okay. So don't be inebriated by that. Don't become complacent. Any second you can lose it, and you might. None of us can guarantee otherwise. So this is why Uddhava is telling, this is the character of pure devotees. But if he's saying this about himself and his associates, what did he say when he went to visit Vrindavan? and saw the character of the gopi's devotion, he was so amazed. Krishna actually sent him there to see these gopis. And he was so amazed at their pure devotion that even he felt compelled to offer his respectful obeisances onto the very dust beneath their lotus feet. Usually we offer obeisances to the lotus feet. He wanted to offer his obeisances to the dust underneath those feet because that's how much respect he had gained for these transcendental gopis upon seeing their love. What did he say? Vande nanda vrajastrinam padareno vahikshnashah yasam harigathod gitam punati bhuvanatrayam. I repeatedly offer my respects unto the dust from the feet of the women of Nanda Maharaja's cowherd village. When these gopis loudly chant the glories of Sri Krishna, the vibration purifies 
the three worlds. Citing many authoritative references in his Logu Bhagavatam Ritam, Sri Lurup Goswami has also conclusively shown that of all Krishna's innumerable devotees, the most dear and intimate of his devotees are the gopis of Vrajadam. We said there are three Haridas of Haryas, Giridaj, Yudhishthir Maharaj, Uddhava, and yet these gopis are worshipable by, by all three of them. So no one can estimate. Mahaprabhu ne kaha ki aradhyo bhagavan vrajeshatanayas. The supreme worshipable deity is Vrajendranandan, Krishna. And Taddhama Vrindavanam. His eternal home is Vrindavana. Or Ramya kachit upasana vrajavadhu vargena ya kalpita. The mode of worship which was conceived of by these gopis out of their natural love for Krishna. That is the topmost attainment. And uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Pramanam Amalam, some say Puranam Amalam, or some say Pramanam Amalam. Either way, it's the most authoritative Pramana, it's also the most authoritative Purana. Prem Apumar Homahan, because it gives us the topmost attainment that human life can afford. Generally, when we talk about Manushyap uh, Chatu Purusharthas, what are we talking about? The four goals of human society. What are they? Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Yes. You have to have Dharma in the beginning, like I said. I asked you all if you've taken a bath, confirmed you're, you're all civilized people. That's called Dharma. Ordinary piety, but you know, ordinary civil behavior, we can say. That's the first thing. You're not really a human being, actually, unless you have this dharma. This is why it's important for all of you, not so much me as you. Kyonki Mahaprabhu ne kahaki, Bharata bhumi te hoilo manusha janma jar janma shartha kori parupakar. Make your own life perfect if you have taken birth in India. First, do that. That's a prerequisite. You can't take an advanced physics course, unless you've had algebra, correct? <laughs> Confirmed. So similarly, you cannot cultivate Krishna consciousness and yes, unless you are a human being. And humanity is not biologically defined in the Shastras. It is defined in terms of adherence to Shastra conjunctions. Tasmat chastram pramanam te karya karya vijanataha, right? Krishna says in, at the end of chapter 16. And conversely, if a person doesn't follow the injunctions of Shastra and acts whimsically instead, just doing whatever he wants, anytime, anywhere, any place, that person can neither be happy nor he'll get any substantial success in life, and he certainly won't go back to Godhead. So the first business as a human being is to be a real human being don't be a pseudo if, uh, this is the word of this is the world of deep fakes now isn't it <laughs> don't be a deep fake human being <laughs> biologically correct human being is not enough you have to understand dharma and this is why i say you have a special mission given to you by chaitanya mahaprabhu because you have any concept of dharma even if it's the wrong concept of dharma even if your concept of dharma requires some fine-tuning, come say, come, you have any concept. And you're dealing with people who don't have a word for dharma. The people you work with, the people you see on the street, no concept of dharma. If we have a concept in our minds, then we require the word to denote that concept, isn't it? Just like I'm told, I don't know, Alaska is not so far from here, but... Uh, they have just many, many words for ice <laughs> because that's a very prominent part of their culture and their consciousness. It's a very important phenomenon in, that, in the Eskimo life. So similarly, in the South Asian life, dharma is a very prominent characteristic. It's undeniable. Everyone knows this. And in North America and Europe, there's no such word for dharma because th that concept is not yet developed. You have to change that, please, because you can. When I was previously about 20 years ago in Redmond, Washington, in the heyday of Microsoft Corporation, 
I was preaching to all almost exclusively uh, Tamil Ayers who were working there in Microsoft. IT. Some in those days it was international Tamil. <laughs> now it's international Telugu. <laughs> but either way, the business is the same. So I used to tell them, you have the system requirements to run this software. So install it and run it. And then you can do something for someone else. That's called Janma Sarha Kori Kodoparupakar. Anybody know the story of Srila Prabhupada and his Parker pen? Raise your hand if you have a Parker pen. <laughs> Parker pen is like a you know upscale pen in the world of pens. Expensive pen, nice pen. So somebody gave Prabhupada such a pen, and Prabhupada was looking at his pen one day, and he saw it says Parker. And Prabhupada was talking with a guest, so he showed him the pen. He said, Parker. <laughs> This is the idea. With this pen, he was doing that parupakar, serving all others and carrying them across the ocean of material existence. So he was, he was one of these residents of Vrindavan. And he could have stayed in Vrindavan, but he, he took a lot of trouble. He could have got away with just slacking off like all of his godbrothers did. But he had such integrity and character. He thought, my, my spiritual master has given me an order. I cannot ignore that. Just like Prahlad Maharaj. Anybody read Prahlad Maharaj's prayers in Canto 5 or especially in Canto 7? What does he say? Several times, actually, he says. First of all, he, he recognizes, I'm only a demon, but I can still do this devotional service because anybody can. Maybe I have to work harder at it, but it's, it's possible for me. But the real impressive thing about Prahlad Maharaj's character is that he's always thinking about his obligation, his duty, his gratitude for what his spiritual master has done for him. My spiritual master, Nadad Muni, pulled me out of this pit full of snakes, frankly, practically speaking. My first duty is to serve him. This is what we're supposed to learn from this Mahajan's character. But we can't do that unless we open the books and read them. Otherwise, we won't do that. when will we have the opportunity here? So, Srila Prabhupada was always glorifying Prahlad Maharaj, and Srila Prabhupada definitely emulated Prahlad Maharaj. Now, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very famous for hearing about what topics? Oh, you're all too smart. Normally, the stereotype, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is absorbed, Radha Bhava Jyuti Suvalitam Naomi Krishna Sarupam, no? So he's famous for discussing with Ramananda Rai and others, the gopis and their inter very, very intimate dealings with Krishna. But actually, the thing that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to hear about more than anything else was Dhruva Charita and Pralhad Charita. These two topics were his favorite topics. We don't have any statisticians here, but numerically we can say this is what he spent most of his time hearing. If only to set the example for us, to show us what are we supposed to be doing while we can. Again, back in Seattle, they printed up these mantra cards that we distribute when we go out for Hari Nam Sankirtan. <coughs> so it gives the Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And then Nimna Likita Haki. Please chant this mantra while you can. <laughs> it's supposed to, supposed to jog the memory a little bit. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, didn't I die before? <laughs> How come I have to keep dying? <laughs> so, you know, and when is the next one coming? We don't know. I came to visit my mother in 2006. And I packed enough supplies for two weeks in my suitcase. But when I was there, she had a massive stroke and a heart attack. And she was comatose for some time. And the doctor said, you know, whoever's got power of attorney, whoever's got the advanced health care directive, you need to have some pretty serious discussions because she has maybe a few minutes to live, maybe a few hours. 
by by an outside chance, maybe she's got some days to live, but she's out. So do it well. You got to do your things now. Somehow or other, by Krishna's arrangement, some people tell me that because I was there, Krishna changed her arrangement. But um, so somehow she pulled out of it, and she lived another six years. Uh, another six years that nearly killed me <laughs> because I took care of her. But the point is that you know nobody's prepared for death. When when she finally came to, and my sister, who had the power of attorney, had to ask her, you know, mom, if we if we push this button, then maybe five minutes you you've got to live, and after that. So my mother had a lifelong policy. She said, you know, I don't want to be kept alive with these machines and you know tubes and all this stuff. Everybody thinks like this, huh? But when it comes time to die in five minutes, she changed her lifelong policy like that. This is death. This is reality. And we don't think anything of it because we're just scratching the surface intellectually, but we don't have any. One of my god brothers, he put it very nicely. Kshudhi Prabhu, anybody know Kshudhi from Laguna Beach? Very witty fellow. So he said, it's one thing to talk about death theoretically. It's another thing to hold a fork into an electric socket. <laughs> it's a different experience, isn't it? So, you know, we have to we have to at least appreciate the uh, the the extreme relevance of what we're dealing with here when we're hearing these things from Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita, etc., even Bhagavad Gita. All right. So what shall I say? Ramya Kachitu Pasana Vrajavadhuvargena Yakalpita. These gopis have executed Krishna worship. In the superlative degree, everyone agrees. So even Vaishnavas therefore worship the lotus feet of these gopis, and they consider themselves to be merely the servants of the servants of their servants' servants. Gopi Bhartuhu Padakamalayor Dasa Dasa Anudasaha. This is the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's philosophy. Ulukale Samprita Tantulascha Sanghatta Yantyo Musalehi Pramukthaha. Gayanti Gopyo Janitanuraga Govinda Damodara Madhaveti. These infatuated gopis, they're milling grains with mortar and pestle. And their loving attachment is thereby aroused somehow, and they're saying, Govinda Damodar Madhava. Mugdha, what does Pramugdha mean? Mugdha Kamatlav kya hai? I know you have this word. Tamil people have this word. Hindi may chalat hai kya? Mugdha means like uh, Anjan Balak, right? Bholi Bali, gopis. This is Mugdha, means innocent, uh, naive, inexperienced. Huh? So Pramugdha means, well, it can be understood in different ways. It, it means that the gopis, it can also mean that the gopis fainted to lose consciousness altogether. Or it can mean that they were very charming, or instead of pramugdha, many manuscripts, they give the roughly equivalent mugdha, which we've described already. And that also means overwhelmed. Prabhupada has translated the word mugdha as captivated in Chaitanya Charitamrita Majjalila, chapter 14, texts 149 through 168. Captivated gopis. It's a certain class of gopis. They're just totally infatuated with Krishna. Ujjwala Nila Mani in chapter 5, text 13 and 14, and other literatures also describe a sp specific class of inexperienced younger gopis who are called Mugdha, which we can say means uh, innocent, these innocent girls. So that said, uh, one way to understand this verse has been explained. The gopis are always absorbed in Krishna, no matter what they happen to be doing, even if they're just uh, grinding grains in that uh, ulukala and whatever. A second explanation is that whatever, something about this activity acted as an udipana, stimulant, to uh, arouse the gopis' ecstatic love for Krishna. And it may not be possible for us to understand that. But even the most learned person can't fathom the activities of pure devotees. That's the fact. 
because the most advanced devotees, they see Krishna everywhere and in everything. Uh, just as a greedy person sees economic opportunity everywhere, just like here we're in the Pacific Northwest, big patches of the mountainside, usually square, they just disappear overnight. Why? Clear-cutting logging industry. We see a beautiful forest, God's creation. They see economic opportunity. And thousands of years of old growth there, they, they with no compunction, they will just take it out. So this is if you're greedy. And similarly, a lusty person, He'll everywhere he goes, he's going to he's going to perceive romance or romantic potential, or he's going to notice all the opposite sex. So pure devotees in this spontaneous way, they will see Krishna everywhere, no matter what. Just like my host, they've got a little little clear plastic bag in which they keep Krishna deity. Nicely ensconced in a little, you know, soft uh, cushion. How in the world did, did they find this? <laughs> the, the intelligence has to be operating on the Krishna channel. Otherwise, you know, you see the same thing everybody else is seeing, but, you know, it means something else for this devotee, right? This is how, this is Krishna consciousness. When I was in college, this is back in the undergraduate days at the University of Austin in Texas. Dr. Richard Larivier, one of the world's leading scholars of Sanskrit, Indology, Dharma Shastras in particular, he was giving a class and he just happened to mention that he went to the Indian headquarters of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness in Mayapur, West Bengal. And he said one thing that impressed him there was that he saw that there was a beautiful garden full of this, uh, what do you call this, dahlia flowers. They're very common in Bengal. And there was a sign there said, please do not pick Krishna's flowers. For us, we, this is commonplace thing. But he was appreciative because he was an outsider. He said, oh, just see, these people are very conscious of Krishna. <laughs> Even if you think you're not Krishna conscious, chances are you are more Krishna conscious than you think you are. And this is, a, this is evidence of that. So... In this way, the, the nature of love for Krishna is that things seen in relationship to him themselves become the stimulants for further, exciting further love of Krishna. It's like everybody, anybody with small children, there are several in this house. So this, this analogy won't be lost on you, I think. If you see the small shoes of your child, what do you think of first? You see your child's shoes, naturally, you think of your child. So in this way, the devotee, when he sees any of Krishna's things, and for your information, everything is Krishna's thing, then he thinks of Krishna out of love, not artificially, not out of gyan, not out of any kind of, you know, abstruse cosmic, you know, ruminations, but because of love. Love for Krishna. And this love... It develops by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Rup Goswami goes on further to explain, in this way, love for Krishna increases itself, just as the ocean increases its own volume through the downpour that comes from rain clouds drawn from its own water, correct? We know, samsara dhavana lali haloka tranaya karunya ghana ghanatvam praptasya kalyana gunana vasya vande guroho shri charanaravindam. The spiritual master is compared to, to the one of those rain clouds. The rain is pulling water out of the ocean by the energy of the sun. And then it moves it over to a parched place like Phoenix, Arizona, where I just came from, uh, or Vrindavan. When I left Vrindavan, I was hanging out by laundry the day before we left. And so I, I had maybe one, one or two days worth of laundry, hung it all out. When I finished the laundry, I went back to the first piece that I hung out and started collecting the laundry because it was all dry. So we're living in a world that's you know like that, and the world's on fire. 
right? Are they still having fire in the north in Canada? They put it out? It was in the news some time ago. I, I only check once in a while. But uh, the ocean increases its own volume with water that comes from clouds that are drawn from the ocean itself. So in this way, love of Krishna also increases. If you have a little bit of love for Krishna and you reinvest that love, whatever little love you have, you reinvest it in this process, then you will gain even more love for Krishna. In this way, hote, hote, we all go back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. I don't know what time I'm supposed to start, but it's eight o'clock right now. And it, we've done two verses only, but uh, hopefully this is, somebody's happy. Or if you have any questions or comments or objections, please feel free to speak up by all means. How many people are chanting every day? Hare Krishna Maha Mantra on beads. Hi, hi, hi. Yeah, good. Okay, so most of you are buddy devotees. How many people are chanting 16 malas every day, Japa? Higher. <laughs> okay, well, so we're doing okay. How many people have read the entire Bhagavad Gita? Raise your hands. Hi. Okay. Srimad Bhagavatam? Less. Okay, that's, that's what we need to work on. That seems to me to be the next step, because then when I ask you to quote verses that I'm thinking of, you'll be able to do it. He got several. He failed at least one. <laughs> so, you know, in this way, all of us uh, gradually, it's a gradual process. We go back to Godhead and only by the divine grace of Krishna in the form of Srila Prabhupada, because while everybody else was sleeping, including most of your parents, Srila Prabhupada was up at night writing these books because he expected somebody somewhere is going to read this book and be moved by it, by the grace of Paramatma. And it could be you. We don't know who we are. Maybe we actually belong in the spiritual world and we just, you know, had a, what do they call it? Momentary indiscretion. <laughs> and here we are. But you can go back easily. Actually, Prabhupada said this about Indians in particular, and it's then my experience with Telugu people. When I was on Padayatra in 1984, I think it was, maybe 85. You know, the, the, this party had gone from Dwarka all the way around to the tip, Kanyakumari and back up again to Mayapur. And Lokanath Swami was, of course, leading that Padayatra. And he said that the best reception they had anywhere was Andhra Pradesh, coastal Andhra Pradesh, means Guntur and uh, you know Singhajalam and even such far-flung places as Narasimhapet. Anybody know where that is? Kaju capital of the world, they say. And uh, yeah, Sun Temple there and yeah, the Ladam Temple near the nearby river Vamshitari. It's called Vamshitari, I think. So yeah. Um, Prabhupada said about Indians in general, you just have to scratch the skin. That means practice this Krishna consciousness. And what comes out? Krishna. <laughs> because as I said to them in Seattle, you have the system requirements to run the software. It's, it, it will work. Definitely it's going to work. With us, it's hit or miss because you, you load the software, but there's some, you know, there's some problem. <laughs> So take advantage of it while you can. Don't lose another opportunity. You're going to die. I mean, it's not a curse. <laughs> Neither is it a threat. But, you know, we're all, we don't know when. We're all going to die. And we have to do something about it now while we can. Those of you who have children, raise your hand if you have no intention to send them to school, no plan at all, not given any thought to it. You see my point? So why do we go 20 years, 30, 40, 50 years ahead? But we don't think about after death. Why? It can only be that we don't really believe that we're not this body or we don't want to believe that we're not this body. One of those two things. That's called either fool or rascal. <laughs> Please don't mind. <laughs> but this is the, Krishna himself is saying such things in Bhagavad Gita. He's calling us mudhas and he's calling us so many mithyacharis and so many other things he says. 
Okay, no questions, no comments. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of my god brothers is an economist, and he he always you know he sees like this. he thinks like this. So yeah, he's he's often em emphasizing the same thing. Another way to look at it is, um, you know, sometimes if your gas tank is empty, you you can the gas tank shows it's empty, the needle is on zero, but there's still some fumes in the gas tank, and you're running on those fumes. If you study the commentaries on chapter 17, say text one through five or six, uh, I think it's Baladevida Pushan's commentary in Bhagavad Gita. There he talks about two different kinds of faiths. Well, Bhavaja Shraddha is one kind of faith. And Shastra Janya Shraddha is another kind of faith, but they're very different because Swabhavaja faith, just, you know, your, your socialization, your upbringing, your background, your family, whatever, you know, that can carry you so far only. You have to recognize the tank is empty and it's only going to work so far. As soon as the modes of nature change, especially if you're surrounding yourself with passionate and ignorant modes, which is the norm in Portland, Oregon in 2023, then, you know, you're, you're, you're finished. You might as well have nothing in the tank because in fact you don't. But if you're reinvesting by hearing every day, like we were saying, that's why Prabhupada quotes all these verses in full throughout all of his books. And if we're chanting Hare Krishna sincerely and asking for help from the Lord, it will come. Rest assured. 100% Krishna is responsive. He may not do so in the way that you want, <laughs> and he may not even do so when you want, but 100% of the time he is always responsive. Yes. There are such responsibilities to, uh, like, as Mahaprabhu wants us to be liberated or, like, uh, for ourselves, but Prabhupada wants us to be still broken free from that. So how can we be in so? For the first part, we are inspired because we have some walls, so we follow it strictly not every day and reading a little bit, but we are not inspired to teach much. Um, inspired to teach. Good, good question. Srila Prabhupada answered this. Uh, enthusiasm is automatically generated if you're very strictly, strictly following all the regulative principles, even the little ones. You ask a simple question, you get a simple answer. We are, it's a science. If you put two particles hydrogen and one particle of oxygen, it's always going to be water and it will only be water always, right? Because it's scientific. Similarly, if we are following the process of bhakti as, as it is taught in the Srimad Bhagavatam and as it was taught through by Srila Prabhupada personally, then we will become Krishna conscious. So if we're not feeling Krishna conscious, we have to just introspect uh, and better yet we have to find somebody that we have faith in and who is affectionate to us and with whom we can relate and we have to ask that person how am i doing what what do i need to do to improve and if they're merciful they will tell you and then you have that that's your that's your new direction then you have to do that so the science is perfect if, if something is not Completely sanguine, and that just means we we've we, we're missing somewhere something we're not not doing right. But the science itself is perfect because it's a science. Is that okay? And as far as preaching, <clears throat> first be assimilating Krishna consciousness and then preaching. Yes, it has to happen in that order because you've got the subordinate verb and the finite verb. They're two different things. Subordinate verb means. Janmasarthakori. It's understood that the, that's coming first, isn't it? In other words, sarthakarike ityadi, whatever whatever verb follows. But you can't have that karike construction unless you know there's another verb coming. So the the main thing you're doing is preaching Krishna consciousness. But the way that you're doing that is by being Krishna conscious. I mean, they they both go together. There's a lot of overlap. It's true. But uh, first we have to become human, then we have to become Krishna conscious, then we can actually 
represent Srila Prabhupada and do what he wanted and do what he did. He expected that. The instruction is there. Prabhupada gave Jai Pataka Swami the in instruction, you should initiate 50,000 disciples. How many has he initiated? 60,000 disciples, at least. <laughs> so yes, this is the point. This, you, you, this, is, this is a good example. I mean, I'm not telling you to go out and initiate people. <laughs> but, you know, do the thing that you have to do. It, it's just like yesterday in Phoenix, we came to an intersection at I-10. Goes from San Diego all the way to Florida. And, you know, on one side, our side of the intersection, there's a red light. On the other side of the intersection overpass, the light is green. So the eyes tendency is to see the green light and move ahead but wait a minute there's a red light right here for you <laughs> that light is for them <laughs> you see this is what we have to recognize there's there's an, a set of instructions that are relevant to our position that we have to follow first then when we get to the other light then we can do the needful you see so dharma is like you know that or another analogy given by uh, another god brother it says <clears throat> if you want to go from portland oregon to la you can just take highway five all the way correct i5 do you start with i5 no you have to take some road to get to i5 isn't it and you have to take the feeder road on ramp you have to take right you're not going to take i5 without dealing with that on ramp unless you're dropped by helicopter so that is dharma it's not the main thing that we're interested in, but it is very crucial. Yonki, with, without that, it's, you're not going to get on the highway. You'll never be able to become great. And we see that. One out of many thousands is, is even interested, and out of so many thousands who are interested and try hard, Krishna says, Hardly one really knows me, in fact. What does that mean, in fact? Statistically, it means one in a million. So this is why. Because people don't, you know, they. everybody has an artist that disqualify them sooner or later. And they're attached to those artists. Either they don't want to read Prabhupada's books, that's usually the, the case. Or, you know, they can't follow something. Or you, know, you have to just introspect and see where the problem is. And if problem is very stubborn, it usually means that there has been some sin, sinful uh, samskarana. Like, you know, what does samskarana mean? Imprint on the mind from some sinful past. Therefore, piety is important. It makes Krishna consciousness a lot easier. Of course, Krishna consciousness is so powerful, it can create piety. That also happens. But it takes longer. It's like trying to light dry wood instead of, you know, wet wood. I'm sorry to say. If the wood is damp and you're here in Portland, that's probably pretty common, right? <laughs> so it is not going to catch fire so much. But in Phoenix, Arizona, where I just came from, <laughs> like that, you don't even need matches. You just take a magnifying glass. That's enough. <clears throat> okay. Anything else? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> it's not Sukriti. It's Sukriti will make you receptive to such a person, but Sukriti will not send you such a person. Mercy. Only mercy. So we pray for mercy. That much we can do. Krishna may or may not give it also. But we pray for mercy and then you know, someday we'll come. But th this is the thing. We cannot be proud of anything because we have no say in this matter. It is entirely coming by someone else's decision and there's nothing we can do. But we can demonstrate our sincerity by following very strictly. And that may even inspire the Lord to be merciful to us. Usually it does. 
But we should understand very clearly that there's nothing we can do actually to to make ourselves Krishna conscious. It has to only be coming from mercy. Now, I've noticed tonight, <clears throat> everything that I've said that someone has said they appreciate, it's coming from Rupa Goswami. <laughs> this analogy about the ocean increasing its own volume, this is from Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu. The three qualifications that you're paraphrasing, that's also from Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu. So read Nectar of Devotion and your spiritual life will become so much more clear. Once you understand that how this is a science, then you, you'll be able to understand how to advance in that science. It, but it is a science. Prabhupada said this nectar of devotion is the complete science of bhakti yoga. All right, anything else? <clears throat> Otherwise, you know, it's late. Kids are loud. Thank you all very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank you.